Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second in our double bill of eight Air Force shows we're bringing you this week. And with excitement building for Apple's Masters of the Air series coming next year, we hope it's going to be next year, one known flyer depicted in the show is 100 Bomb Group navigator Frank Murphy. To talk about the republication of his book, Luck of the Draw, I'm holding up my copy here, is his granddaughter, Chloe. So I'm going to bring her in now. Good afternoon. How are you today? Hi. Nice to see you. I haven't even seen the copy yet that you're holding right now. Oh, well, I had it. Your publisher sent it to me in July. I read it on holiday in the south of France. and it, I, don't, I don't even have it physically myself. I have no, the No, I feel version. bad now. I'm excited to see it. Yes. That, hold it up again. That looks so nice. Oh, yeah. So beautiful. I mean, uh, I, yeah. I helped design that cover, but I haven't actually physically felt it. I'll be in London next week when the book officially hits stands and bookstores. Um, and I'm really excited about that. But thank you for having me. No, thank you. And um, what we're going to do today is we're going to start with a video. Um, because then we'll bring you back in and chat to you. So, folks, we've got a sort of four and a half, five minute video that uh, Chloe provided, which kind of has in includes interviews with Frank and a bit of footage about the 8th Air Force. So uh, we'll start with that now. So, so um, here we go. Seven weeks after Nazi Germany declares war on the United States, the U.S. Army's 8th Air Force is activated at an armory in Savannah, Georgia. Its mission? Transfer to England. Create a heavy bomber force. Defeat Nazi Germany through high altitude daylight strategic bombing. The 8th Air Force will become the largest air armada ever committed to battle. My name is Frank D. Murphy, M-U-R-P-H-Y. Uh, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia on September 9, 1921. I grew up in Atlanta and spent all of my life, well, not quite all of my life. I had two years in Cleveland, Ohio in 1929 and 30 during the Depression. It was the only place my father could get a job. So we went to Cleveland for two years. We came back to Atlanta in 1931. I uh, was in Atlanta up until the war started in uh, December of 1941. I knew that very likely I was going to get involved because Several months before that, they had revised the draft requirements so that anyone uh, from age 21 was subject to would be subject to the draft, and we knew that eventually anybody my age who was healthy was going to have to go into the military. Well, I decided that that if I was going to go into the military, I wanted to go into the U.S. Army Air Corps, which had just recently been changed to the U.S. Army Air Forces. The name had been changed in June of 1941. Uh, I was a student at Embry University uh, at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, and I had uh, gone out to the uh, airport in Atlanta and taken flying lessons and had uh, soloed in a little Piper Cub, and, uh, and I flew and I enjoyed flying, so I knew that uh, when my time came, uh, I would uh, I would want to go into the Army uh, Air Forces. We could see our own airplanes going down, getting shot down, and it was just. It was just a, uh, it was just just a frightening sight. Some ME 109 uh, fighter aircraft came in, and one got in behind us and shot us and killed our tail gunner, and then started two fires in the airplane: one in the radio room and one in the number three engine. I looked around and I saw the co-pilot coming down from the flight deck, and he motioned for me to follow him, and he pulled the release handle on the forward escape hatch. It fell away and he jumped out. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, we, we, we've got to go. So with that, I managed to get my parachute on and I went back and I followed him out the door. I fell for 
my terribly long. I'm at 20,000 feet, I was anxious to find out if the parachute was going to work. So I pulled the, the D-ring and fortunately it did work. Before I hit the ground, I realized how fast I was falling. When I hit the ground, of course, I, I sprained my left ankle very, very badly. And while I was there struggling to get out of my parachute, some German farmers came up and uh, a lady standing there um, said to me in perfect English, for you the war is over, which was something that thousands of American flowers heard during the war. Luck of the Draw is my grandfather, Frank Murphy's memoir about his experiences in World War II. He and his fellow men fought for the freedoms that we have today. He is actually featured in Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg's upcoming TV show for Apple called Masters of the Air. But in the meantime, you can read all about Frank and his fellow men in Luck of the Draw. Well, a lot to unpack there, Chloe. And I should say to people, the links to uh, the website and to purchase the book are, as always, in the description below. So um, the book is amazing. I mean, I read it on a holiday. It kept me out of the pool. It kept me out of spending time with my family. But that's my problem, not yours. I mean, it starts off quite conventionally in that it's the young American who's not obsessed by aviation, but a a being in the air is that sort of childhood dream of so many people. But immediately, as you get into the book, he has to overcome the first of, of, of numerous hurdles. Um, the first of which kind of I think is important about is his eyesight and depth perception. So so take us a little bit through the, the process of, of your grandfather joining the Army Air Force and, and that 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 problem. Well, you know, first of all, gosh, watching that video that I helped make and hearing his voice every time, you know, makes me so emotional to hear it. Um, so, you know, my grandfather, he always wanted to be a pilot, but he was in school at Emory University. And that's a very prestigious school um, in Atlanta, Georgia, where he grew up. And um, he in, enlisted uh, as, right after Pearl Harbor. And he had every intention of, you know, I'm going to join the 8th Air Force and I'm going to be a pilot. Um, and like you said, he had these different tests and they told him that his eyesight just wasn't up to par. And so they said to him that there was a big need state for navigators and that if he wanted to be an officer, he could be a navigator. And since he wanted to be an officer, um, that seemed like the next best option for him. And uh, my grandfather was very, very smart, good at math, a very even tempered type of a person. So it's funny how life works out because although I think he would have made a rock star pilot, uh, he definitely was the type of person that you would want to be able to get you from point A to point B while you are encounter encountering, you know, heavy flack around you. He's the right temperament. So that ended up uh, being a really great um, choice that he didn't choose, but that nature chose for him. That's a great start. And we'll talk about the importance of navigation and, and the crew working together a bit later on. But, um, you know, we, we talked about on yesterday's show, this is you know, the 41, 42, 43 period is when the USA has recognized very early on they're going to need a hell of a lot more of everything, aircraft, um, navigators, pilots, everything. And, and the number of people that are passing through these courses across the USA is is insane when you look back at it, just as the, the size of the 8th Air Force was when it became. But as your little introduction video said there, it was still pretty something pretty new that people have been talking about this idea in the 1930s of strategic bombing being the thing that would win the war. But um, in the early days, it, it, it wasn't necessarily proving um, that, that that it was the tool to win, win the war. And one of the things I really liked about your book and or the grandfather's book, I should say, is is that. He was quite analytical, both at the time and also later on. You've said in other podcasts that you, you know, you, you don't consider him a historian. He wasn't a historian, and you don't consider yourself a historian. But 
the book does have lots of examination of the process. Is this right? Is it working? Is the techniques working? And that 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 is unusual. A lot of memoirs are just kind of here's what I remember, and they're almost being dragged along by the process. Is that something that you noticed when you when you you know rediscovered the manuscript? Of course. I mean, this book is so heavy into detail. So it's not just a memoir from the heart. I mean, my favorite parts are the telegrams to his mother um, asking for things while he's a prisoner of war, um, talking about his time in Stellog Loof 3 and then Stellog 7A or jumping out of the airplane. You know, there. I think that the thing is, is that World War II is such an interesting um, subject matter that some people want the heart and other people yeah. want all the details and the analytical. And that book brings both. My grandfather was a lawyer um, when he ended up returning uh, back to Emory University. Then he went to law school um, after he got married. And he was just a very detail oriented person. And he spent about 10 years working on this book, traveling around. And I think that maybe he never realized that it would be so much into the details of everything. I mean, look at the appendices. Some people yeah, say like the amazing. appendices are half the book. But I, I think that also part of the process was he wanted to really do right by all of his fellow men, right by the 8th Air Force, right by the 100th. And really, you know, this is before Don Miller had written Masters of the Air. So I think that at the time, my grandfather, when this came out in 2001, when he self-published it with a friend of his, that he felt like there was a void in the marketplace for something like this. But really, he had written it for the family. Um, but yeah, there, there, it's heavy, heavy on the details. Well, that's amazing because we have had Henry Sledge on, uh, Eugene Sledge's son, a few times on the show. And 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 I knew Don Baguette, who wrote, wrote, wrote Kurahia Screaming Eel in Normandy. And these were people who were writing their books ostensibly for their own families and also to just kind of explain what they'd been through, some sort of cathartic process. And yet in the same time, they ended up being these classics, which, you know, luck of the draw, from my point of view, is absolutely a, a classic a fair force tone because it does as you say that it does two things it's a very personal story for those who want that but it also said the appendices as you say goes to all 100 bomb groups aircraft who was in what the mission details the flight details and and some people will will, will go straight to that bit um the aviation fans and some people will be bawling their eyes out at the moments as you say the telegrams the letters the the experiences and and that's that's why you know in my case i, I liked it so much so you said there yourself the last response to my question about celebrating commemorating the men alongside him because the the kind of cliche bit of the book is his crew is that typical that you put together for a war movie it's kind of the brooklyn cab driver the farmer from the prairies all put together so i know you like to talk not only about your grandfather but about the crew so do you want to tell about some of those those characters that he found himself with yeah, well, uh, Augie Gaspar is someone that my grandfather was friends with for the rest of his life. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, what's really great is he really goes into detail about the members of his crew. And um, actually, I have a picture of my grandfather, yep, see Bubby, if you can see when they landed yep. in northern Africa um, and they were there for a couple of days and there's some really good pictures in there. Um, you know, I think that what's also really important is that two of the men on his crew died the day that he was shot down on October 10th. And we're coming up on that anniversary and I forget which anniversary it is, what number it is, but I will actually be at Thorpe Abbott's next week, mm. the air force base where he flew out of near dis. Um, I've been before. I, I don't know if you've ever been there. I know it very well. I'm from East Anglia. So I, I, oh, they, okay. all those bases in my backyard as a kid growing up. Okay. So I will be there. And I think that really, um, as you get to know these characters and then two of them pass away, including one of the, the, including a tail gunner, I think that it really puts your life into perspective, right? I mean, in the blink of an eye, everything can change. And think about all the generations of people and myself that wouldn't be here today. Yeah, it is a lovely museum, Thorpe Abbott. So I love Carol and Ron uh, who take care of it, the the couple that take care of it. They turn it into a museum. It's it's lovely, Thorpe Abbott's. Um, but I think it goes back to the title of the book, that life is fleeting, that a bullet either has your name on it or it doesn't. And I think that um, it's definitely shaped a lot of my adult life, knowing that had he died that day, I wouldn't be here. You know, it's kind of crazy to think that just your life in this very moment, Paul, that we every decision that we make could affect the lives of the unborn. How crazy is that? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's what by you 
and your mother bringing this book back to us because saying it was republished sort of implies that it was a massive great book when it came out but of course it wasn't because it was sort of self-published and it didn't really it didn't really well not quite self-published but it didn't have the big mass release that this one is now so you know um but you you are always talking about how it has influenced your family and you're looking at it from your lens adding to what your grandfather said which makes it from my point of view the whole package because sometimes veterans memoirs as we've talked about they're they're, they're kind of they're personal, but they don't necessarily send a message ac across to other people. But you know what you just said there is exactly what I, I think is is so good about it is that idea of, of looking back and considering the odds that these guys are facing. And you know, if you want to share with our audience just what the odds were for a navigator or a crew joining the Eighth Air Force, you know, in in the middle of 1943, it was it was dramatic. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the numbers offhand at this very moment, but what I will say is that the week that my grandfather was shot down, it is now known as Black Week. But everyone here, you all are the audience and you already know these things. You don't need me to, to tell you that. But, um, you know, the eighth, I have it here in front of me, they lost 88 heavy bombers on those strikes of those maximum uh, effort missions. And I think that, uh, you know, only 33 American bombers returned without battle damage. Among the 2,900 men, there were 642 casualties. For the 8th, it was a loss of over 18% of the force. Um, and, you know, I think that it just goes to show you that my grandfather um, made it to 21 missions and he really overcame the odds to even get that far. And then obviously being shot down on October 10th during the Munster raid. Um, it really just puts into perspective for you just how much he overcame to get to that point. Yeah. Um, it's so rare that I end up meeting a veteran or meeting a family of a veteran who had actually completed all of their missions and made it back. Rosie Rosenthal's son, Dan, uh, is one of my really good friends and his father, we all know is one of the main stars of Masters yeah, of the yeah. Air, and he makes it back, obviously, um, but goes through hell and high water to make it back every time he gets shot down. Um, you know, going into his time in Stalag Luf 3, uh, some pretty, pretty crappy conditions. Um, I went to the eighth air, uh, to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado this past spring. And I actually got to look at a lot of their archives of what these soldiers were able to get out of the prison camp during that march to Stalag 7A when the Russians were coming, the march to Mooseburg, um, and the things that they were able to bring back. And it's so fascinating to me that they had these almost little cities within these prison camps. Um, and remember Stalag Luf 3 is where the great escape took place. And my grandfather was there when the great escape took place. Um, and how they had a radio station, how they had little like newspaper bulletins, how they, you know, would tell you the weather forecast and how they really were autonomous and the prison guards really left them alone. It wasn't until and obviously my grandfather was writing telegrams during this time that would take almost like six months to get to his mother and his father. And then by the time he got a response, it would be almost a year later, he'd get like the message that was sent on Christmas, the next Christmas. Um, so his hopes were pretty low. And then when and, and also, I don't want to ruin too much, but music is something that kept his spirits up. He was in uh, the Prisoner of War band, the Kriegi band, um, and that was something that brought him a lot of joy. Um, and there's something really interesting about a moment in the prison camp when he's asked to move to a different part of the prison camp to be with other men from the 100th and to be with some members of his crew and he turns it down and i want you guys to read that and 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 learn about that but then when he goes to Salog 7a that's when things all hell breaks loose right i mean i think you know paul that that prison camp was really meant for i think I mean, the numbers, I've heard different numbers, but I think it was meant for like 10,000 men and there were 100,000 men in there. Yeah, it gets crazy. The Germans are just being overwhelmed by a certain point in the war. And um, and um, yeah. That's and, when and he lost all the weight and that's when he got lice and dysentery and he was frail, frail, frail at the end. You saw a photo of him right after he was liberated. You see him in that picture in the video that we played at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and it was it was really, really tough. And it's a miracle that he survived his time in the POW camp, I think. 
Well, I mean, it's a miracle all round because, you know, the, the 21, well, 20, it was the 21st mission that where all the drama occurred. But to have completed the 20 before, you you didn't get that very often in 1943. Sure, by 1944, by 1945, when, when the situation has, has changed, doing that number of missions became a little bit more normal. But 1943, and this is a reminder, folks, was the with the really bleak year. The 8th eight, the Air Force Bomber Command, the whole concept wasn't quite working. It was it was nearly working, but the losses were just were just devastating. And you know, there people were making questions at, at the um at, at a higher level. And one of the things I heard you say in other podcasts is that um you, your family is st still sort of wondering whether or not, you know, who is it in your family who referred it to it all as suicide missions? Is that your I think it was maybe my grandmother. Um yeah. you know there at least from what I've heard from my grandmother and a few others and just historians that I've gotten to know that there was a lot of controversy over the accuracy of daylight bombing raids and that really these guys were just sitting ducks in the sky and that it was really um, not worth it to, to, to do that. I, I don't know if you have opinions on that, but that's something that comes up quite a lot. Um, obviously, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why you would want to do daylight bombing raids, but it obviously increased the amount of casualties um, that we suffered during the war. So my grandmother and many felt like these were suicide missions. And that's why I'm excited for people to see um, Masters of the Air I haven't seen it, but I've heard great things because I think it's really going to show everybody the odds that these guys overcame. And I don't know if it's on the book that you guys have, um, but I have it. Well, I have it behind me because it made the New York Times bestseller list. You can kind of see it. I, I have I have it behind me right here. Um, but on the cover of the book in the U.S., there's a quote from Tom Hanks and it says, yep. how did those boys do such things. And I think that that really is the truth is that they remember they were boys. They were so young. No, absolutely. And we have discussed on the channel, the merits of strategic bombing and, you know, without going down to a detail that I don't need to go, the, the concept was going to work. It was just going to take a while to get there. But while it was getting there, people were dying. Um, luckily there were enough people coming through the system to replace those that were dying. So, so it was going to work mathematically, but that doesn't make it very good if you are one of the people in the middle part of this who are whose whose crew doesn't stand much chance of making it through the missions and and as, as you said there the POW experience the, the death march as, as it's often been called at the end when they get moved to different camps and some were moved right out to the to the, to the eastern front I mean these these are stories that need telling and again it comes back to that title of the book you know your grandfather beat the odds more times than probably he was due to and that the the thing that you talk about and your mother talked about and, and, and he even in the epilogue in, himself is the realization that he'd beaten the odds and therefore um, that that self-reflection and possibly survivor's guilt. You know, PTSD wasn't a thing back then or we didn't label it back then. How do you think what, what would you classify your grandfather as in, in that kind of regard? Well, it's funny that you ask that. Um, when I was working at CNN up until um, not that long ago, and now I'm over here at NBC News, um, I actually did a, a piece about that. Um, so, you know, I can actually pull it up for you guys. Um, I'm on my computer. Um, I did. I interviewed a bunch of different experts and things like that on PTSD. I came to the conclusion that my grandfather likely suffered from uh, some some amount of post traumatic stress. Yeah. Although everybody handles post traumatic stress differently, and I call it the invisible wounds of war. Um, so, first of all, he didn't talk about his experiences in the war uh, for more than fifty years. Um, he didn't share it really with his children or his own wife. Um, he wrote in the book, quote, I often wonder why Providence allowed me to survive when so many others did not. Um, and like I said, when he married my grandmother, he didn't even mention he had been a prisoner of war. It was his mother that, that told her. Um, 
And obviously PTSD has had so many different names over the years. And after World War I, it was called shell shock. After uh, World War II, it was known as combat fatigue. Um, after Vietnam, it was called post-Vietnam syndrome. It really wasn't until 1980 that the American Psychiatric Association officially recognized it as post-traumatic stress disorder. And as we all know, we're not calling it a disorder anymore. We're calling it yeah. like post-traumatic stress. Um, and so I've done a lot of research on this. And obviously, I'm close with the former governor of Texas and the former energy secretary, Rick Perry, who's doing a lot of work with veterans um, and, and PTSD with ketamine tra treatments and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, he, he, he's, he also says in the book that he spent the rest of his life walking with ghosts. Um, so I definitely think that there is a bit of a why did I survive and others did not. You know, and so I um, I wish he was still here today so that we could talk about those things. Um, he yeah. never turned to drinking or violence. He was such a calm person and he was such a good husband and a really good father to his four children. Um, so I wish he was here to talk about some of those things. My grandfather died when I was in college in my second year um, or at university, as you guys would say. Um, so we never really got to get into some of the things that now I reflect on, but I, well, we, we've all been there. We've all been there. We're not questioning in my case, my grandfather, my great uncle who, who were in world war II. I, I wish now I go back and ask the questions that I, I would like to now, but you just talked about your grandfather's calmness, how he, he went through life very sort of steadily and didn't go to alcohol. But one of the things I think is not unique, but quite unique is that, Often veterans join the associations of whether they're army or air force or it, and he he did some of that. But he also had this real desire, need to go out to Germany, to go back to Europe, and it started quite early. Not only the Amer the bases he flew from in the U in, in the U UK, but also to Germany and meeting some of the, I mean, and I don't know how to call it, but the, the enemy. I mean that that's the only way I can the only words I can think of to describe it. So that to me is a really interesting part of the book. Share a little bit more about about that aspect of your grandfather's um, experience. Yeah, so um, it really goes back to my grandfather was working for Lockheed Martin. He worked with planes his entire life. I mean, he loved airplanes. And um, my grandfather was living in Saudi Arabia um, at the Lockheed Martin post there with my grandmother. And it was on uh, a, a flight from Riyadh to London when my grandmother was reading a book called Goodbye Mickey Mouse. And so when my grandfather got his hands on it on that flight and read it cover to cover rather quickly, he came back and he actually reached out to the publisher and eventually met, met with the author who let him know that there were these reunion groups the 100th bomb group reunion that was started by Rosie Rosenthal. And I go to those now. So that sort of was the beginning of, oh my gosh, these are some of my friends and my comrades that are around. And he started going to those reunions in the eighties. Then you saw him going over to Thorpe Abbott's, getting to know Ron and Carol, uh, who now have turned it into a museum, like I said. And then you saw him starting to do things like meet up with that Luftwaffe pilot. And um, I think that there was just a lot of, um, I was, I've never served in, in the military or the war or been in a war. So I don't know what that's like, but at least in his case, from what I understand, and he never spoke to me directly about this is that um, there was an understanding that both of them were fighting for their country. And in the book, he writes about how he often spent the rest of his life wondering about the planes she, he shot down. And I thought it was very poignant that he said that he hoped that they too went on to have children and grandchildren, right? So I think that um, war is really complicated and no, necessary evil. Um, and also something that I thought was really nice is he became friends with the German farmers that you saw in the video that we just played. My grandfather went back and he got to know the family that actually took him in. It was their field and they were the ones who turned him over to um, the German police. So he became friendly with them. He was a pen, pen pals with them and they would write letters to each other. Um, my grandfather didn't hold grudges. He was a really kind uh, human being. But yes, he was a 
fascinating person and it's a it's a fascinating thing and i'm just really excited that i get to go to thorpe abbott's next week and be there and he he knew i went before he died i write about it in the foreword of the book that i went to thorpe abbott's a year before he died so i'm really grateful to know that he knew that i was interested um in all of this that's good. And we have a question from Yost Staraf, who's been on the channel talking about his particular interest in the 8th Air Force. Is, have you visited the 100th ARW at RF Mildenhall? They have some rooms named after 100th Bomb Group veterans. Its aircraft are named and adorned with nose art. Have you been there? That's funny that you say this. I am going a week from this Friday. I will be going out to Mildenhall. I'll be staying out there. And then um, I will be at Mildenhall on saturday then i'm going to duxford on sunday wow, wonderful and then i'm going to um east anglia books i'll be out there um and then i will be at milden hall for a ceremony and then they're unveiling some new nose art um there and then i'll be at thorpe abbott's again and they're having a really really cool thing and lucky john lucky luckadoo who's 101 years old he's one of the last surviving yeah, he's been on world with two tv he's a previous alumni of the show yeah he'll be there next week with all of us um isn't that remarkable so yeah we will all be out there no oh, brilliant and i'm um, going back to this this, I think curiosity is the word that springs to mind your grandfather had for, for, for England, for Germany, for, for looking at, you know, he, obviously he, he kept in contact with some of the, the former men of his unit and things like that. But because it's come up a lot in these in these Eighth Air Force shows, this is number 25 we've done about the Eighth Air Force, is that if you don't get shot down, you're always at that distance in that you're thousands of feet above the war. You're not separated from the violence of the war because, you, you know, you still get hit by flak, you still get hit by enemy fighters. But the experience on the ground is where often people could begin to start hating the enemy. They could begin to start questioning just the loss of life. Because we talked about it on yesterday's show is that you're the guy ends up in Liège in Belgium. So he is seeing the rail yards that his own friends have been bombing the day before. He's seeing the devastation. He's seeing people clear up. You know, they're seeing the uh, the prisoner war camps, the, the, the German guards, the, the, the suffering that's happening on the ground. And I think it would be quite easy uh, to, to come out of that with some ele elements of hatred and, and bitterness. And, and yet it doesn't seem, to, he seems to find a way of moving through this and, and keeping balanced. And, and I, I saw again in another podcast you did that you, you felt your grandfather had no faults at all, apart, apart from the iffy air, uh, eyesight at the beginning. He just was one of those almost perfect human beings. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have my grandfather on a pedestal. I think that what's really interesting is um, when you when you're reading in the book about how he's flying over um, these different European countries that decades later he would go back and visit to see um, these towns being essentially uh, ruined and how sad that was to see it from above, um, you know, cities that he had read about in books or countries that he had one day wanted to go. And there he is um, obviously trying to avoid hitting at any national monuments and things like that. But there he is trying to bomb, bomb a ball bearing yard or a, a rail railroad station. Um, you know, my grandfather wasn't perfect, but he, again, never raised his voice. He was a happy, kind person. And he was the kind of person that everybody always went to him with their problems. And I think that all of that resilience and kindness, a lot of that came from his experiences in World War II. I think he was a young man at that point, but I think it shaped the man that he grew into and became. He had a lot of patience. And my grandmother used to, used to say that he had the patience of Job. And I think that that's why everything in life that happened with his children or his grandchildren, nothing ever seemed as big of a deal as the experiences that he went through during World War II. And so um, I was able to reap the benefits of a man who had lived a very long and hard life all in a short amount of time, you know, and maybe that's one of the reasons why he didn't talk about those experiences. And maybe it's one of the reasons why his fellow men didn't talk about it, what they saw, hmm. the things that they saw, right? I mean, the nightmares that he had, you know, I think he carried a lot of, uh, 
a lot of emotional wounds his entire life. Yeah, no, definitely. And I wanted to read you something that he wrote in the book. Um, He wrote, it is difficult to put into words the sense of powerlessness and vulnerability one experiences when standing completely defenseless before a formidable armed wartime enemy of your country, knowing that the entire might of the United States is of no benefit to you. And I thought that that was interesting. Yeah, no, definitely. And, I, and it kind of connects very neatly with my next question, which is you, know, you talked about we all have problems in our lives. You all have issues to face. And as a, as a battlefield guide in, in my kind of previous life, um, I remember having to do a tour, a tour where I was, I won't say which company it was for, but they were doing it as a business training thing. And I tell, told them about this very heroic act where these people were running along and knocking out machine guns. They were saying, and how can we turn this into um, our day-to-day business practices? And I can kind of get the idea of leadership and learning lessons, but relating to what someone like your grandfather went through in a crew of 10 flying at X thousand number of feet above an enemy countries, uh, navigating without GPS, using all that human brain power with a pilot who's barely out of his teens and a crew who are barely out of their teens. It's very difficult for people who are watching this 21, 22 to understand the weight of responsibility on, on their shoulders. And so as someone who works in media, you, 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 you are, you're there at conveying stories to people, getting information across to diff- people of different generations. Um, h- how do we make sure that younger people would read these books? I know the Masters of the Air will be a, a TV series that will help, but there's nothing quite like reading books and reading it directly from the people who are there. So how do we overcome that hurdle of, of getting young people interested to even just accept that these, that these the things, these guys had to face was, was did that would actually were actually happen. They are actually true. It seems so fantastic now, 80 years on, how do we do that? You know, I really think that it starts in, in at school. I think that it comes down to changing the required reading. I think that it's showing footage and explaining to these young men and women, either in university or maybe seniors in, in, in high school, when you're teaching World War II, I think it's about profiling some of these individuals, getting any of these veterans like Lucky in there to speak, to put a human face to this. I think showing episodes of Band of Brothers in the Pacific and Masters will be incredibly helpful to understand the air, the ground, and the sea aspects. Um, I'm all about learning from different mediums. So I don't necessarily think, I mean, I remember, um, oh my gosh, uh, what is the book that everybody has to read uh, to graduate in the United States? It's such a long book. Um, On the All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, All right. So, you know, same thing. I wouldn't necessarily expect every single high school senior to want to read my grandfather's book, but maybe there's parts of these books that you could assign, um, I think would be really, really great. And then I think that these museums and the Thorpe Abbots and the Milden Halls, even though that's an active military base, but, um, you know, all of these different places in the mighty 8th Air Force Museum in Savannah, Georgia, and the 100th Bomb Group, it's about trying to get the uh, family members involved, right? So I'm talking to my two young sons who are ages four and six. I have the 8th Air Force um, like logo on their back of their iPads. We have replica dog tags. I have the one of the copies of the book in each of their rooms, right? I have pictures like the one that's behind me all in my office, all of these pictures. And I just think, you know, everybody's going to do their own thing. I don't want to tell anybody what to do, but one of my best friends, you know, her husband served in Iraq. He saw his best friend get blown up next to him. He's has a lot of PTSD, right? And she has four daughters. Um, I don't think any of them will end up serving in the military, but you never know. But I think it's about no matter if you're a man or a woman, a little boy or a little girl, but it's about talking about your uncle, your neighbor, your grandfather. Um, And it's not enough to say thank you for your service. I heard somebody tell me recently that that's actually like really offensive to say that to a veteran, like thank you for your service, that instead we should be asking questions. What division were you in? Yeah. But, you know, ask ask somebody more about themselves. Um, you know, I think it's a collective effort. It's things like World War II TV. 
you know, yeah, it's you. about just trying to keep this going and talking about it. But really, like, you know, I got to say, right, we owe so much to Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg. I mean, look what they've done. This is not an easy thing. This is a huge undertaking to get this TV show on the air, right? It is costing so much money. And this is something that they've wanted to do. And with Don Miller, with his book, they optioned it. This has been a monumental undertaking, right? And it's it's people like that that make these stories timeless and not forgotten. Mm. Because one day you're not going to have people around to talk about those firsthand experiences. Then you have people like me where I can only do so much in talking about it. And I'm no expert, right? So it's about having those other mediums, right? And I think it's really important, but I don't know, Paul, I think it's a really hard question. I think it's gonna require it, it all of us, you know? And that's why like anybody out there that's reading the book, at least the US profits, um, all of them go to uh, the 100th Bomb Group Foundation and the World War II Museum. So I think it's also just about spreading the word. If you have a teenage son out there who might want to be in the military one day, not to scare him or a young woman, maybe have him read a chapter of my grandfather's book. Not the yeah, whole, definitely. maybe just a chapter. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and Yost is making the point that we need to spread it out the, the, uh, to, from the 8th Air Force to the other 8th Air, 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 the other Air Force as well, the 9th, the 12th, the 15th, because the 8th is kind of like the entry level. It's like Band of Brothers about the 101st, what about all the other divisions in the ETO and the Pacific? So those people who watch the series should be brave enough to, to branch sideways as well and look at the other flies and other nationalities. I know. And, you know, look, a lot of the focus, obviously, or all the focus right now is on the 100th. But obviously, there's so many other bomb groups within the 8th. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, the other air forces as well. No one is better than the other. Right. They're all, you know, they all equally won the war together. I just um, it's just happenstance. But you know what, though, my attitude is better to have people talking about it and learning about it in in terms of one bomber group than not at all. Right. Okay. So I just think that, you know, there's always room to go on the Internet, self-publish a book, write an essay, write a blog post, make your own video. Right. Who's to say that there won't be other TV shows and movies in the future? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and who would have thought that a granddaughter. 70 years later would take my grandfather's book after his experiences and publish it. So you never know that if you put something out there, pen to paper, what your grandchild or your great grandchild will want to do one day. That's the yeah. truth, you no, know. Definitely. So to bring it back to kind of World War Two and and the actual contents of the book, kind of probably the last question is that you know, you, you, like myself, you know, you watch movies, you have to report on things for your job and your various jobs over the years. When you're reading the rereading the book, which are the which is the bit? that almost sounds like fiction it is so impossibly incredible. You know, is it the bailing out of the aircraft? Is it the surviving the, the, the POW camp? Because it, it, reading it myself, there's bits of it. I kind of go, this did happen because it is so, it is so incredible. You, you, you have that moment. So I wonder if I have an excerpt from that moment. Um, so I have it. Let me see if I can find this for you. So I would say that on January 27th, 1945, when Hitler ordered the guards to evacuate all of the American and British officers to the West due to the Russian army advancing to liberate their troops from the camp, at around 11 p.m., my grandfather said that they grabbed their pitiful belongings and began to walk in the deep snow to a God only knows where destination. And this was a harrowing moment that is something ripped right out of a movie. Um, and this was the death march from Stalag Loop 3 to Moosburg Stalag 7A, a prisoner of war camp in Bavaria, about 20 miles northeast of Munich, the one that we spoke about earlier, Paul, yeah. built to accommodate 10,000 people, but there were over 100,000 POWs from every allied oh. European nationality being housed there. It was a terrible situation. It was a terrible, terrible three days um, of marching. 
Uh, little rest, no food, sub-zero temperatures. Don Miller has told me it was one of the coldest winters um, in Europe, in that part of Europe at the time. And my grandfather writes about his fellow men collapsing in the snow from exhaustion, and they would carry each other. They would beg with each other not to give up. And my grandfather traded his shoes with a fellow soldier. He traded his leather shoes, which was like a commodity for a pair of wooden clogs. And I have one of those shoes in my home office. It's the one thing that no museum or any place has, because it's just the one thing that I want to hold on to for now. Um, and my grandfather was put into boxcars for two days. Um, he writes about how the Germans refused to open the doors to even allow a little bit of sunlight in. And then he finally arrived on February 1st, 1945 and lived there. And he described it as a living hellhole of all hellholes. So he was there from February. Then he was liberated April 29th of that year. And he'd lost 50 pounds. And like I said, it was a really bad situation. But if that doesn't make you want to read the book, then I don't know what does. No, exactly. I mean, great advert for it. And that's why you're here. And, and it's why I love books, because my imagination reading that created that far better than I think a TV show could. Not that I'm not looking forward with bated breath oh, to sure. TV show. But, you know, that's the thing about a book is you're in your own little world. It connects you directly with the, you, you don't have a, le a screen between you and the experience. So the words are coming straight in there. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, what an amazing, so great, kind of almost um, fun question from one of the view viewers. So, Soylent Green is saying, has Chloe ever taken a ride in the B-17 and sat in her grandfather's position in the middle of the plane? Okay, so no, but I've been in a B-17 more than once. Uh, the Mighty 8th Air Force Museum in Pooler, Georgia, right outside of Savannah, has one. Been in it. Have not. I have to admit, I get a little nervous when I'm flying. Um, maybe one day. Maybe one day. But I happened. have been in a B-17 a long time. I was up in Sally B about 30 years ago, and it was both yeah. terrifying and fantastic at the same sure. time. I was... Yeah, it was. Um, I don't think I'm designed for that kind of thing. But yeah, no, well, we will bring things to them because you've got um, other things to do. Any kind of final words that you think, you know, your, if your grandfather was part of us as a third, a third guest on this, what would he be saying to people in 2023 about either his war or the 8th Air Force or the 100th Bomb Group? It's hard to say, but I think that he would probably just say that he was not a hero and that he was just doing his job, protecting his fellow men and serving his country, you know? And um, I think he would be humbled that we're talking about him today. I hope he knows. I think he would think it's so neat. That was a word he used a lot. I think he would think it was so neat that this TV show was coming out or that his book became a New York Times bestseller. I think he'd cry. And not to mention it was number eight on the New York Times bestsellers list. So I don't know if that is a, you know, I, I definitely think that that's, that there's, you know, power in that number, obviously eight, eighth air force. Um, I think he would be really appreciative and really appreciative to people like you, Paul, for doing what you do, what you're doing is heroes work. So you're a very nice person to be doing what you're doing. You know? Well, thank you very much. And uh, and it, it means just now for me to say thank you for, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. And um, I'm not that busy. <laughs> not, well, good, good luck with the book. And it, not that it needs my endorsement, but folks, it is an absolute. Help, I mean, yes. help, help, from... help me, help me. Let's it's... raise awareness. Let's get people to buy the book in, in the UK. Let's do this. Good I don't know. Well, I mean, UK, in Australia, UK. around the world. I mean, I read a lot of books from for this for this job and, and, and most of them are good. But your one was the one I chose to take on, 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 on holiday within i sat and read it in july and it was it just was gripping uh, i read it in about three days cover to cover so fantastic stuff so chloe thank you for joining us folks thank you for your comments and, and questions and go out there and buy it this is paul Woodhouse for world war ii tv saying i will see you all again tomorrow cheers everybody bye <laughs>